High Point University Presents, A Conversation with Tom Brokaw and Nito Cobain, is a production of UNC-TV, in association with High Point University. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet one more wonderful experience with one great thought leader on the campus of High Point University. We're delighted that you're with us today because you're about to listen to a man who has had a wonderful life, contributed measurably to the betterment of our world. On this very stage, it has been a tradition that we invite men and women of influence who come here to share with our students, to share ideas, to have an interchange of dialogues that will increase the intellectual gifting of our students and prepare them for a life of success and significance. And this afternoon on this campus, I am very proud to introduce to you a man you all know, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Brokaw. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to have you here. Thank you. <laughs> have I been looking forward to this? The last I hope they time... feel that way at the end. That's the only thing I worry about. <laughs> um, the last time, Tom, that, that um, I heard you in person give a speech was in the United States State Department in Washington, D.C., uh, when you and I were at the Horatio Alger Association for Distinguished Americans. Uh, I'm privileged to be in an organization with Tom Brokaw, and he gave one of the finest presentations to a group of men and women who represent America at its very, very best. So here at High Point University, I'm thrilled that you're here, and uh, do I have some questions for you? Lots of them. <laughs> Let them come. So I have gone back to read all the books that written by Tom Brokaw and a lot of stuff written about Tom Brokaw. And um, I um, particularly liked the book titled A Long Way From Home, in which you do an excellent job in an autobiographical way telling us about your life and where you grew up. Let me just quote one line from that book, Tom. You said, I could not be the man I am today without the boy I was yesterday. Now, Tom, you're the son of uh, Jean, a uh, post office worker, and Red, a construction, a construction worker, construction man. You're the eldest of three boys. You lived in a house that was only 20 feet by 20 feet in size. You mowed lawns to make some money. You delivered papers across the city in which you lived, the town in which you lived. You're a lifeguard, a Boy Scout, president of the student council, delegate to Boy State, and you received the highest civilian honor in the United States of America given by the president of this country and named the Presidential Medal of Honor. My, oh my, you're all American. You are what every boy hopes to be and every girl aspires to become professionally in life. You are the American dream. Well, I, that's very generous of you, but the opportunities that I had uh, I really do credit my parents most of all. They were pure products of the Great Depression. My mother, extremely bright, graduated from high school at 16, wanted to be a journalism major. The college cost $100 a year, and they lost the farm in 1932. It was not possible. My dad was the last of 10 children who was turned out of the home when he was in the third grade. It was a rough, rough family situation, very depressed economically, and he had to uh, make his own way. And he was taken in by a Swedish homesteader uh, who was a man who drilled wells, moved houses, and had a little land and did things. And he really trained my dad how to first drive a team of horses and then how to operate big machinery. And as a result, my father had this intuitive skill. If it had a motor, he could run it. If it was broken, he could fix it. And he was a rough guy. He, apparently, people who came into town had to challenge him on Main Street. Most of them left right after that. Uh, <laughs> But he had his eye on this beautiful woman who lived south of town on a farm, the most unlikely romance you can possibly imagine. Here's my red-haired, tough guy father. But he made a bet with a friend for 50 cents that he could get a date with her when he saw her in a school play. My dad never lost a bet because he never bet on anything he was going to lose. So he, he courted her, and they began this wonderful life, had the three boys. And 
their attitude always was I could be anything that I wanted to be, and they would be there for me. And they caught the good wave after the Depression in World, in World War II of the 50s when uh, America began to boom again. There were public works projects all across the country. We moved to the middle of South Dakota uh, where they threw up a town overnight, in effect, for the Corps of Engineers to build a huge dam, the largest in the world at the time. And in that town, workers came from all over the South and all over the West and all over the Midwest, and it was like the United Nations of the workforce. And I had all these friends who brought different tastes and cultures and it was perfect for someone with a lot of curiosity. So I always thought that my parents moved to the right place at the right time for me. But their goal always was that I would go to college and that I would be able to elevate uh, my standard of living. That meant at that time that maybe, maybe if I got lucky, I could make $10,000 a year, if I got really lucky. And that I would have you know, a good life. Well, it worked out a little better than that but they were always there for me, and what helped me most of all was living in working class towns, because you couldn't talk your way into some kind of sense of accomplishment. These were can-do, hands-on families. I don't think my father ever went to the store to buy anything that he could make. And the best story of my childhood is that I did have a lawn mowing business, and I was a push lawn mower, and I thought I could make a lot more money if I have a power lawn mower, Dad. I've seen one in Sears that I can get, I think, with, you know, at the end of the week. He said, we can make a power lawnmower. It was not what I had in mind. I, we went out in the garage and we, ma we made a power lawnmower. It was as ugly as anything you have ever imagined, but it was indestructible. It had a little Briggs and Stratton motor on it. He took uh, wheels off an old wagon to make the wheels. He took a black piece of platform and made that, and then he welded the handles on it. And I could mow through anything with it. And I have always thought, that's the beginning, really, of how you get through life, is that if you can make something, you should do it. And this book is uh, filled with these experiences. Uh, you said, living through the Great Depression formed other lasting values. This is your, speaking of your parents, of course. Um, you spoke about uncompromising work ethic, thrift, compassion, perhaps most importantly, perspective. How so? Well, the perspective was that you got what you earned. It wasn't anything that you could talk your way into. Uh, the, uh, the worst thing that could be said about you in the small working class towns was, he's just a blowhard. You know, if somebody said that, that was the worst kind of insult that you could have. Um, I've been thinking a lot about those men that I was around with my father. I was a talkative kid, and, uh, but I, I really realized that all the talk in the world wouldn't actually repair things or get things done that I would really have to go out and put my shoulder to the wheel a little bit. And the lessons of the Depression are with me to this day. Even though I'm in a financially secure position now, I still don't know the price of everything that we buy. And I look at it, you know, uh, before I buy it. And my mother, I was thinking about her the other day when I had, uh, we brought the whole family in for the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And it was a big deal for us. So we flew in the San Francisco crowd and we flew in the New York crowd and the Santa Monica crowd took over practically a wing of the Four Seasons Hotel, had a very big party. And I said to my wife as we were leaving, you know, if Grandma Jean were still with us, she would stop and say, my God, Tom, how much is this costing? <laughs> and, and I would put my arm around her and say, Mother, it's better not to know, quite honestly. <laughs> uh, speaking of which, you speak a lot about your mom. You said Mother made it clear that she was not going to spend all her hours trying to keep up with the laundry needs of three boys. You say, we were all taught to wash and iron shirts and pants and to make minor repairs with needle and thread. And this is the part that, I'm not sure if it's completely true, but you correct me. I still find myself, you speak of yourself, I still find myself in a fancy hotel suite, summoning an ironing board and iron so I can press some item of clothing rather than pay the outrageous price and go through the inconvenience of waiting for it to be returned from valet service at the Four well, Seasons? That's well, that's what I do when I'm paying for it, but if others are paying for it, then I'm able to send it <laughs> I do have an, I, it's so conditioned into me that I, I don't think about it often, and I was doing a debate uh, when uh, President Bush and, and Ross Perot and Bill Clinton were running against each other, we were doing a debate, as I remember, in Virginia, and I popped a button off a, uh, of a blazer as we were about a half an hour before we were to go on, reached down and my kid always carry a little sewing kit with me and uh, took off my blazer and I'm sewing my button back on and I looked up and there were about 90 people staring at me. 
<laughs> but I got it back on in time, and, uh, and I, I, I know how to, you know, kind of whip it and get it done. And that's been very, very useful to me over the years. Well, uh, Hypo University has a calendar, uh, Tom, that we gift our parents and our alumni. Uh, today, the calendar has your quote on it. Yeah. And your quote is, it's easy to make a buck. It's a lot tougher to make a difference. You've made a big difference in your life. And you say in the book, when I return to my home state, I always try to swim in the river channel just to feel its restless currents again as a reminder of my early struggles to master them as a beginning swimmer. They taught me to understand force and to use it to my advantage, taught me that to make progress often means giving a little. You've given a lot lately, haven't you? Well, I have, but I think it's the obligation of people who have the advantages that I've had and the, the luck that I've had, quite honestly. I have a high profile because I'm on television. Uh, I've written books that have been well received. I've earned enough money to be able to give a fair amount of it away again. And people, I think, look to us uh, in those jobs, especially since I took people through so many difficult times in their lives as a television anchor beginning um, in 1968 when the country was kind of coming apart with Vietnam and everything, and then flash forward uh, to 1989, the Soviet Union was collapsing, Tiananmen Square in China, uh, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia, the release of Nelson Mandela, one of the really most striking stories that I've ever covered. And I became the link, linchpin, if you will, uh, between what was happening and what people were seeing. And then, of course, the longest day in my life was 9-11. And I went in that morning very early thinking that there had been an accident, no more than that. And then on the way in, I heard about the second plane, knew that this was a terrorist attack on America. And it was the most challenging day of my life because we didn't have any clue about where it was coming from and what may happen next. We're out there, as I often said, without a net below us. So my immediate counsel to my colleagues, and they really didn't need it, Matt Lauer and Katie were there with me, and then Tim was in Washington, was don't speculate. Just deal with what we know. Let's not try to get ahead of the story in any way. And then after the second tower went down, we knew a little more. And I, uh, without kind of thinking about it intuitively, I looked into the camera and I said, this will change us. And we have to be prepared for those changes because this is an act of war. We're now at war. And a lot of people have cited that uh, later to me, saying, that got my attention. I knew then what we were in for. And I later, describing 9-11, said it took everything that I knew as a human being, as a citizen, as a husband, as a father, and as a journalist at that stage in my life to be able to get through that day. Now, in fairness, my two colleagues, Dan and Peter, were doing a terrific job on their or at their organizations as well. Those kinds of events are the quintessential moments in a television journalist's life because the television set becomes the hearth around which everyone gathers. They look to us for, what, for reassurance and for information and for facts. And that was the most testing day, I think, that I have ever been through. And so I've always tried to keep that in mind. Uh, don't overplay your hand. Don't pretend that you know something that you really don't know. There's far, far too much speculation that goes on now about almost everything. And it's uh, driven a lot by social media, by bloggers and, and uh, what goes on in HuffPro and Red State and all the other different sites. The fundamental obligation that we have as journalists is to let you know which is, what is factual and put it in some kind of a context so it's useful to you. And when we lose sight of that, that we lose sight of our fundamental mission, quite honestly. What do you think about trust in journalism today? Sometimes it is difficult to delineate between truth and opining. And we have a very uh, active school of communication here at Hypo University and journalism major. And we try to ensure that our students understand that at the end of the day, you, you must have the trust of the audience, the person. And you, and you have trust if you uh, stick to the facts, if you really keep everything, as I said, in context and try to reflect what it is that you have been able to learn that day and not impose upon it uh, necessarily your opinion. The new digital environment is filled with far too much opinion. Everybody's just kind of swinging away. 
is a perfect small example. Uh, it's a vast universe, as you all know, and it has to be filled up all day long. My wife and I were in a very serious auto accident in New York three years ago. Uh, a young woman was killed. Uh, we were trapped beneath a postal truck that was thrown across the uh, median highway, and we were stuck there for about two hours, and everybody was going by with an uh, iPhone camera of some kind or another, and they were blogging. And I immediately got a message out to NBC, and I said, circulate this instantly. Here are the facts, because I wanted everybody to have a, a document to work from. And it reflected exactly what I had in the police report. And the next morning, I got up early, and I said to Meredith, we're both very active. Uh, we, from the beginning, we have been um, both excited and interested in and uh, wary of the impact of this new world in which we live. And I said, watch this. And I typed in our names, and there must have been, I kid you not, 500 sites that were leading with Tom and Meredith Brokaw and auto accident in New York. It could have been a site dedicated to animal husbandry, but if they had Tom and Meredith, they could put that on there and they would probably hope to attract some people, even though we don't know the first thing about animal husbandry, by the way. And most of it was pretty scurrilous attacks on us. Most of it was, uh, and they didn't know Meredith, they knew me as a broadcaster, but most of it was, uh, pretty unsettling. I've got a thick skin, and I said to Meredith, this is what we have to understand that a lot of people are going through. And once it's there, you can't retrieve it. I could go on that site today, and we would still be there and treated in that same fashion. This has happened to me again recently with some things that have been going on at NBC. People are making up stuff and putting it out there, and I can't knock it down fast enough or hard enough, and it sticks and it stays. So that's the downside. Here's the upside. If you're not a couch potato, and you can't be anymore, if you put as much effort into uh, determining where you're going to get your information on a daily basis as you do into buying a flat screen television or a set of running shoes or a new car or a piece of furniture, uh, you can get some very, very good, reliable information out there. I get up in the morning. I know the sites that I want to go to that are the political commentary sites. I'm a pro. That's what I know, and I know how to, which ones to believe and which not to believe. And they're all across the political spectrum. And then I go to the traditional media. You know, I go to the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, and then pick out a couple of newspapers around the country. Hit a keystroke, I'm on the Financial Times of London, edited by a friend of mine, the best international newspaper that I know. If I want to find out about what happened overnight, I go to the Council of Foreign Relations, where I'm a member of the board, and we've got a great site for, uh, in a nonpartisan way, telling you what happened overnight in the international arena. And then there are some people I've kind of come, gotten used to. I want to hear what they have to say. They're interesting. They're individual bloggers. I have a friend at Breitbart, which is a very libertarian site. But he's a very smart guy, and he always has an insight that I want to hear. So I become active as a consumer. I just don't take the first thing that pops up on the screen. All right, Tom, give me a couple of uh, quick um, memories about if not turning points, certain important, certainly important moments in your life. Uh, when the Berlin Wall was coming down, you were the only uh, notable uh, US Actually, the only one who had live capacity the to be there around the world, right? In, in, in that place to see it happen. What happened? Uh, I went to Berlin, not because I knew the wall was coming down, because I had a really smart colleague who was our foreign editor, and he came to me on Monday and he said, not much going on here. You know, it's bubbling over there. Why don't you go over there? It'll be interesting for a couple of days. And I said, that's a good idea. And I left on an overnight plane, flew to Berlin, spent the next day uh, in the eastern sector, which we'd not been able to get into before. It was all very interesting, but it was not wildly dramatic. They were, what they were doing at that time East, German was in such, East Germany was in such turmoil. The, the uh, younger generation was pushing for independence and getting rid of communist rule. So they were shuttling people out to Czechoslovakia, and Czechoslovakia said, we can't handle anymore. So they're trying to figure out what to do. The next day, I go back into the Eastern sector, and it's pretty much the same thing. And we had a satellite ordered. In those days, you couldn't just snap your fingers and have satellite capacity. We had ordered one. And we'd ordered a big crane as well in case I had to go live. And about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I said, I don't, I don't think it's going to be worth it to go live tonight. I'm going to a news conference, however, and we'll see what that produces. And I have an interview with a very important East German official who was presiding at the news conference. And it turns out, by mistake, at the end of the news conference, he was given a piece of paper 
And he said, the Polar Bureau has decided that East Sherman residents, the GDR, can go out any of the uh, uh, access routes and exit routes that they choose to. And then he got up and walked off. And there was this paralysis in the newsroom and the uh, press room. Did he just say the Berlin Wall is coming down? It can't be possible. And people were yelling at him, and he kept on going. I had an appointment with him to go up and interview him. And I had my very strong-minded and strong-armed young friend, who was my producer, who had arranged all this, Michelle, leaning against the door, keeping other reporters out so we could get the exclusive story about what was going on here. And in fact, he sat there very calmly, and he said, yes, it says all members of the GDR can go through any of the access routes that they want to. Well, I ran out, and I said to my colleagues, most of them were newspaper men who were still going over the statement, I said, it's down. This thing is going, and it had been broadcast in East Germany. And raced to Checkpoint Charlie, and by then the guard who had given us a really hard time coming and going just waved us through, and I got out and I said, well, did you hear what was just announced? He said, da, and I said, what do you think? And he looked at me and he said, I'm not paid to think. <laughs> and we went back to the office and there was chaos at that point because now it ricocheted around the world. And we had the only satellite capacity that night. Germany didn't even have satellite capacity. Uh, the BBC didn't have it. We owned that story on live television. And I went out to the wall, and uh, it was uh, joyfully chaotic. The students from the West had gotten on top of the wall. They were encouraging the Easterners to come over. The Easterners are still trying to figure out whether they can believe this or not, or whether they'll be shot if they try to come across. East German guards were hosing some of them down. They kind of stopped. And then one young East German jumped up on the wall and raised his hands, and everybody cheered, and our cameraman arrived from uh, strauss baunholmer Bridge, where the guards there had been on the phone all day trying to get instructions about what to do, and were discussing among themselves whether they should shoot the East Germans trying to go through the gate. And finally they said, I don't want this on my conscience, and the East Germans poured through. The wall was down. I go on the air, and just before I go on the air, I look down, and I'm a big outdoorsman. I had one of my raddiest, really, outdoor jackets on. It just looked terrible, and I thought, this is gonna be around forever. So I turned to one of my colleagues who had just come from London where he'd bought a beautiful blue all wool top coat. And I said, Betcher, give me your top coat. And I grabbed his top coat and put it on and I gave him my ratty old jacket. And I looked terrific, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and we went on the air and we owned the story until about two in the morning. Betcher is now a professor at the University of Oklahoma at the journalism school. And I was out there for a ceremony recently and he had packaged up his blue top coat and presented it to me. So <laughs> I now own it forever, and I'm having a Under Armour is making a jacket for him in Oklahoma Red with Mike Betcher, Berlin Wall, 1989. Did you uh, get a piece of the wall? I got the first pieces of it, I think, uh, that came one of my, we, we were not, we had no idea what was gonna happen at any given moment, and then suddenly we realized people were up there pounding on it, and I had a wonderful little computer expert, and uh, I'll never forget, he came to me, with eyes were about this big, and uh, I always call it Mr. Lee. And I said, Mr. Lee, what are you, what's going on? He said, here, it just came off the wall. Mm -hmm. So I got that big chunk, and then I got several others, but I took the big chunk, made it up into smaller parts, and had it encased in, uh, in, in, in plastic, and, and had the dates put on it, and sent it to friends and other people. Mm -hmm. I still keep a big chunk on my, on my desk. When uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was at uh, his height of influence and power, you were uh, one of very, very few people around the world who got to him and interviewed him. What was he like when he was at his best? Well, I always said that he could have been the mayor of Chicago. I mean, he, was, he had just great political instincts, and he was a big farm boy, uh, really, from the Ukraine, and, uh, and he was a new kind of communist. Uh, I, the first time I saw him was when he had that memorable meeting with, with uh, President Reagan in Switzerland, and I went out to the airport uh, deliberately to just see what he looked like coming off the airplane. Most of my colleagues stayed for the, where the meeting would occur. I wanted to see how different he was. And it was uh, just stunning. All those guys used to, we used to say they were dressed in cardboard suits. You know, they'd kind of walk off. They looked like the Russian version of the mafia. Gorbachev steps off the airplane with his really handsome wife dressed in modern Western clothes. He has a wonderful new kind of hat on and a great looking top coat. He goes to speak and before he speaks, he reaches into his pocket and takes out a a pressed, uh, freshly pressed handkerchief and gets the uh, uh, perspiration off his lip. And I thought, we have never seen a Russian president act in any modern way before. So this guy is going to be different. 
then we started this great contest about uh, who's going to get the first interview with him. And I had a wonderful colleague by the name of Gordon Manning who had friends in the, uh, in the, in the Russian hierarchy. And we worked and worked and worked. I poured more single malt scotch and more prime rib down Russian apparatchiks than you can possibly <laughs> imagine trying to get this interview. And we got it. And I flew to Moscow um, in 88, right before uh, uh, Thanksgiving. And we did the interview. And it was one hour simultaneous translation, not perfect, but it was the first time America had ever seen him. And he was, uh, he did the ritualistic attack on America at the beginning. I thought, do I challenge him? We've only got an hour. I'll just keep on moving on and we'll try to get stuff out of him. The interesting thing is I said to him three quarters of the way through the interview, do you always check your decisions with Raisa, his wife? And he said, yes. And I said, all of them? And he said, you have my answer. They did not play that part of the interview in Russia. Mm. <laughs> we played it back here, but they didn't play it there. Um, and then we've stayed in touch. He's not well uh, now. I have a great affection for him. Uh, I think he's an important, important figure in history. He made one big mistake, which was he, he really thought that he could hang on to the idea of communist control. And he lost a lot of his very best advisors over that issue. And he. One of them said to me recently, he wasn't willing to spill blood in dealing with his opponents. And I think that was probably true. And that's when he got arrested, and then he was never able to regain power. But we all owe him a lot for putting perestroika and glasnost on the table in Russia and changing the game. Uh, I'm in the midst of trying to get President Putin to do an interview. Uh, that's a little more difficult at the moment. Uh, I did the first, I think maybe the only interview he's ever done with an, an American broadcast journalist I did when he first took office. I had a dinner for him in New York when he came with a lot of my Russian-oriented American journalist friends. And it went on for two and a half hours, and it was really uh, pretty cantankerous back and forth. He never smiled during the entire time. Gorbachev would have made a joke. He would have tried to charm us. Putin is not interested in charm. He's an old KGB agent, and he's a true nationalist. He's a much tougher guy, and I think He's a much more dangerous guy, quite mm -hmm. honestly. You covered Watergate. You covered the Martin Luther King era, among others. What memories do you have from those times? I always thought Dr. King was successful, in part because of his eloquence, and also primarily because he believed in the rule of law, and he believed in nonviolence. And so when Selma happened, and that was a defining moment. I was at the station feeding the videotape back up to New York that night. I remember I had a wonderful uh, Southern colleague who was the videotape editor. And he was like a lot of Southerners. He, you know, he was not a racist, but he was also not a pro-integration guy. He was just kind of, I'm, I'm going to try to live my life. And I made him run the tape back and forth. And I said, Eddie, that's just wrong. You can't, we can't live like that in this country. And he would look for something that would try to make it a rational act. And I, finally, he looked at me and he hung his head and he said, it's wrong, it's just wrong. When that went out across the country, the Selma Bridge, at Pettus Bridge, that changed the temperament of the country in a lot of ways. People began to see that everywhere. Now, having come from the industrial north, I knew that they had problems that were every bit as large. Omaha was in many ways more segregated than Atlanta, Georgia. And Omaha blew up two years later. So you could just see this happening. And my line about race has always been, I've been fascinated by it during my entire career, in part because I realized as a young white working class kid from South Dakota who went off the rails in college for a while and kind of recovered, if my pigmentation had been different, I wouldn't have gotten that first job in Omaha. I wouldn't have gotten hired in Atlanta. I wouldn't have been able to do a lot of the things I was able to do, even if I had been an African-American Phi Beta Kappa with all the broadcast skills in the world. I couldn't have gotten hired, but I did get hired in all of those places, so I'm very conscious of that. What we have now is the dilemma of the inner cities, and we're beginning to see the rise of this again. When desegregation came along, those who could get out with whole families did. You go to Jackson, Mississippi, go to the inner city of Jackson, Mississippi, and the traditional black neighborhoods, and there's almost not a single whole family left and a lot of high school dropouts. You go into the county around Jackson 
and there are very successful African-American families. They're lawyers and physicians and they're business people because they got out. And when you say, can you go back and help in the inner city? And they say, I'm trying to build a life. I took two or three families back down there and they said they have the best memories here, but you know, I'm, my first children are going to college at this time. We have to worry about them. But we can't have what we've got going on, this burning fuse. And there's got to be honesty across the board. There's got to be more honesty in the inner city about what's going on there and who's responsible. There's got to be more honesty on the part of the majority community about how tough this is and how we're going to have to deal with it. But it is, I think, the test socially in this country for the next several years about how we try to cope with this. And it's uh, everybody has to get tough minded and that begins with the inner city and they have to acknowledge the errors of a lot of the things that are going on, the crime rate. Here's a perfect example. They got all bogged down in Baltimore over semantics. The mayor said they were thugs and then immediately the community said, you can't call them thugs. These are just misguided young people. A month earlier, the man who had said that was chair of a forum because they had 90% of the homicides in Baltimore were African-American uh, responsible. 90% of the victims were African-Americans. Those are not misguided Boy Scouts in there somewhere. There, there are people who have gone completely awry and we have to begin with an honesty of dialogue, which I really feel strongly about. Watergate, quick answer to that is, um, it was the proudest I've ever been about the working in the press. I was a White House correspondent. We never speculated in the way that they do now. We just took the facts and played, and, and played them out every night on what we knew. We didn't try to have any conjecture about how this was going to end. And I've said often that when I got off the air at 7 o'clock on, um, on John Chancellor or David Brinkley, I'd start working the phone for the next morning for the Today Show so I'd have fresh material. Now, if I got off at 7 o'clock, they'd hit a button and I'd be on Chris Matthews or one of the cable channels and they'd say, well, he's guilty, isn't he? I mean, he's guilty. Don't you think he's guilty? I mean, it looks like he's guilty. And uh, you know, we can't have uh, an enlightened political dialogue. The most recent example of that was Chris Christie. There is, you know, look, Chris Christie's got some problems, but nobody has been able to put his hand in Bridgegate. There were people who probably thought they were doing the thing that he'd like, but, and, and everybody was hanging him out to dry. I just thought it was unfair. I didn't know whether he was guilty or not guilty, but I said we cannot find him guilty until we have facts. Facts are what drive our business. One of the uh, major contributions you've made to society is when you uh, were moved to write the book, The Greatest Generation, and then subsequently The Greatest Generation Speaks and other, and other contributions like that. Um, a friend of yours and a friend of ours here at Hyper University, in fact, he's on our national advisory board, General Colin Powell, says of your book, The Greatest Generation Speaks, he says it's full of wonderful, wrenching tales of a generation of heroes. Tom Brokaw reminds us of what we are capable of as a people, an inspiring read for those who wish their spirits lifted. Give us a quick overview why you wrote The Greatest Generation and what moved you to put so much time and energy in doing so. Well, I'm a product of The Greatest Generation and my, my parents came out of that generation um, and my first memories of life were living on an army base in southwestern South Dakota. It was an ordnance depot where they stored and tested ammunition. It was the most rattlesnake-infested, uh, sagebrush, alkaline country that you can possibly imagine. And they threw up this army base in about 20 minutes. And we had a house that my mother, there were three boys, and my mother, and it was coal stove in the middle of the living room. They had a heat and a uh, wash tub, the bath for my infant brother. And my dad went off to join the Seabees and they pulled him back because he could make the place run. It was this guy, as I said earlier, could you know fix anything and he plowed the roads and he make sure all the machinery ran. So we were there during the war and my earliest memories were everybody going off to war, next door neighbor, high school student, as soon as he graduated, enlisted in the Navy. I still have a picture of him in his Navy uniform. Uh, heroic people coming home uh, from war, uh, all the bombs that were being tested out there. And then the war ends and we go to 
uh, the middle of South Dakota, the Fort Randall Dam, and that kind of all faded for me. But everybody that was raising me was, uh, you know, the, the coaches and the, and the teachers and the businessmen and the engineers, their wives had all been through the war. Now I, you know, rise up through the ranks and on the 40th anniversary of D-Day, I go to Normandy not thinking about the greatest generation, thinking this is an important anniversary. It's a beautiful part of France, they have great seafood. I was training for a marathon, I'll be able to run through the hills. And the first day, I walked onto the beach with two members of the Big Red One, the first division. They were in the first wave. And what people forget is that uh, folks were smaller in those days. Um, if you look at uh, induction ceremonies, most of the inductees look like they're malnourished. They're very thin, they're often small than they are now. When I say to them, what do you remember about basic training, they all light up and say, breakfast. I never had breakfast like that before. Got my first new pair of trousers or new first new pair of boots. These two guys talked about the ramp going down and immediately their lieutenant and their sergeant were shot through the head. So you have 20, 18 to 20 year olds who've never been in combat facing the most ferocious counterattack you can possibly imagine on their own. They race through the waves, they get onto the beach, and they fall down behind a tank trap, paralyzed with fear. And a colonel comes loping down the beach, and he leans over him and he says to them, men, there are two kind of people on this beach, those who are dead and those who are about to be. You gotta keep moving. And they said to me, he gave us courage. And they went up to the shingle, as it was called, which is the first beginning of the rise, and then they looked at each other and said, you remember what happened there on the slope? And I said, what was it? And they said, well, it was a minefield, and the sappers who had detonated the mines, had, a lot of them had been injured, and they were lying off to the side, they were hitting themselves with morphine and smoking a cigarette and say, step there, step there, step there. And at the end of the day, they said, we thought we made it through one day for the rest of our lives in this war, we're gonna take it a day at a time. One of them earned the Medal of Honor, the other one lost both legs. I was so emotionally shaken by that, I went to lunch, and at lunch, a raw bone, big guy came over. I recognized him immediately. And he said, Tom, Congressman Sam Gibbons from Florida. I said, of course, Congressman, why are you here? And he pulled out a clicker. And he said, I was here uh, 40 years ago. I was in the 82nd Airborne. I said, tell me what happened. He started telling me, tears started running down his cheek. His wife came over and said, I've never heard these stories before. My God, I'd never known what he'd gone through. I went back to New York and I began to think about him. And I began to collect more stories. And I started using them in commencement addresses, frankly. And David McCullough, the historian, came to me after I spoke at his granddaughter's graduation at Yale and said, Tom, you're onto something here. And on the 50th anniversary, I used the phrase for the first time, the greatest generation on, on the Today Show. And Stephen Ambrose, the great World War II historian, said, if you don't use that, I'll steal it. So I began, <laughs> you know, collecting more stories and wrote it. Uh, in about a year's time. There were too many people who were left out, quite honestly, but I must say that it's the most gratifying thing I have ever done, and uh, my guess is that it'll be the first comma after my name and my obituary. It won't be about being a television anchor, man. it'll be Tom Brokaw, who coined the phrase, the greatest generation, comma, and I couldn't be prouder, quite honestly. And we're proud of you for doing that. In fact, you'd, you'd be glad to know that in this audience today, there is a gentleman who dropped out of high school, <laughs> to serve in the U.S. Army. He served in the Army, Northern Africa, and Italy during World War II, at first as a corporal. Then he received a field commission to be a second lieutenant. And then he received the presidential unit citation. He remained in the Army Reserves with the Korean War. He used the GI Bill, Tom, to attend High Point University, then High Point College. He finished his high school requirements in 1946 through a special high school program for veterans at High Point College. He entered High Point College, baccalaureate program, and completed the four-year requirements, only two and a half years. He graduated with the class of 1949, magna cum laude, and was ranked third in his class. And Mr. Tom Brockow, please meet Mr. Gurney Stroud, who's sitting right there in the audience. Would you, would you please stand, Mr. Stroud? You know, those are the stories that we need to remember every day. And they are in every family in America. 
And when I first started to write the stories, and I'm sure this is true with you, you probably never talked about the toughest experiences, that you just didn't want to bring them home. People wanted to leave them behind. And I had to pull them out of these veterans. And then when they, when they realized that others were talking, they were beginning to be more free about it. And it was very gratifying. But they were products of their time. Here's a quick anecdote about it. My mother worked in the post office in a small town, and she was like the managing editor of town, because everybody came into the post office in this working class town to send a letter home or send money home or to get mail. So she would come home every night with these great stories. And one day after uh, Halloween, the, one of the most popular guys in town uh, was the guy who came in and fixed your furnace and, and, and did the power stuff, and he always had a pocket full of Tootsie Rolls. And uh, Gordon, uh, came in the day after Halloween, and he said to my mother, those high school kids were just out of control last night. And mother said, oh, come on, Gordon, what were you doing when you were 17? And he looked at her and he said, I was landing on Guadalcanal. And he turned around and walked out. <laughs> and mother came home and in her journalistic way shared that story with me, and it stuck with me. So when I began to write the book, I called mother and I said, where do you think Gordon is? And she said, well, I think I can find out. He was living in Idaho on a, another Corps of Engineers project. And uh, I tracked him down, and I called, and I left a uh, word for him to call me. And he called me in New York, and I said, Gordon, I want to talk about your days as a Marine. And it was this long pause. He said, I've never talked about him. And I said, well, I'm writing a book, and I want you to be a part of it, because I'm sure that uh, your story will resonate with everybody. And he said, well, the reason I haven't talked about it, I saw my brother die on a beach at Bougainville, and uh, he was the reason I joined the Marines. I was 16, lied about my age. We went on for a little bit, and then there was this long pause. I said, Gordon, you still there? And he said, yeah, but I just realized I'm paying for this call. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, OK, I'm going to hang up. I'll call you back. <laughs> I called him back. I love that story, frankly. <laughs> Um, Tom, you, you rose to the pinnacle of television, no question about that. And yet you're a guy who had no TV signal in his house. It's an amazing story. That's why we said you're the, you're the American dream personified. I brought something with me today, and I want to show it to our audience. It happens to be a silver dollar. What does this remind you of, silver oh. dollar? Your father gave you a silver dollar? Yep, he did. I why? still have it. Well, I, you know, my, my dad was, um, he, he thought that was emblematic of this country for one thing, and he thought it would have great value. When we would go on family trips, this is another story about money in that generation, we'd go on family trips. We'd go to Minneapolis, for example, and my father was beginning to do, by working class standards, pretty well, and we had relatives in Minneapolis. So we'd go, all the boys would jump in the car, we'd drive to Minneapolis. And we'd go downtown to this favorite Chinese restaurant, which didn't have anything like that in South Dakota. And my dad would call the three of us over, and he'd open his wallet very carefully, and there'd be a $100 bill in there that he'd gotten for the trip. Whoa, man, we'd, our eyes would be big. He never spent it. <laughs> <laughs> he just had it with him, you know, and made him, made him kind of feel good about yes. where he was in life, and it was that kind of thing that, that he passed out to his children as well. Um, and there was a great story about my success is that when I signed a very big contract at NBC, it was starting to get a lot of attention. And my dad called me and said, are these stories true about how much you're going to be making? And I said, you know, we called him Red. He was this big, muscular, red-haired guy, very red-haired. I said, Red, we've never talked about money before. Well, we're going to start now. Well, I'm just curious, and it hangs up. About a week later, the Time Magazine had a very accurate accounting of my salary, Dan's, and Peter's, and everybody else's. And I get another call from my dad. He said, well, I'm sitting here reading Time Magazine. I said, yeah, but I thought we'd settle that. And he said, I said, why do you keep coming back to this? He said, I'll tell you why. He said, for as long as your mom and I have known you, you've always run a little short at the end of the year. We need to know how much to set aside this year. <laughs> <laughs> now you mentioned Meredith, your wife to whom you have been married for 53 years. Of 53 August. years. And uh, little did I know, but I should have guessed, that she was Miss, Miss South Dakota. She was Miss South Dakota. And you were on the air, and you, uh, you misused the privilege that day to flirt well, with her. Well, that's been exaggerated a little bit. 
uh, we were beginning to see each other a little bit, and it kind of came apart after that. But in our little hometown, I was a radio. I was on the radio station when I was in high school and college, and uh, the Miss South Dakota contest was going on on the other end of the state. And there was a lot of excitement about a hometown girl was in the contest, and so we stayed on the air until we could get the results. It was in a different time zone. And uh, a little after midnight, the banker chaperone called and said, Tom, Meredith's the new Miss South Dakota. And I said, that's great. And I made that announcement on the air right away. And he said, would you like to talk to her? And I said, of course. So Meredith's voice comes on. And uh, she says, hi, Tom. And I got totally carried away and said, hi, honey. Oh, my God, I just realized <laughs> I brought <it." laughs> Oh, well, there she is, Miss South, Miss South Dakota, Meredith all from Yankton. Good night. <laughs> in your new book, A Lucky Life Interrupted, you share openly and uh, rather incisively your recent challenge with cancer. You look great. What's going on? I'm, uh, there was a broadcast on last night, some of you may have seen, called A Lucky Life Interrupted, based on my book, and my family got involved. We never have used, uh, the, it's been a kind of an unspoken agreement in our family that I'm the guy who goes on television. They have their other lives, they don't want to be a part of that. But what I learned, I was diagnosed uh, a little more than a year and a half ago at the Mayo Clinic, and uh, multiple myeloma is a nasty disease. It's incurable, but it's treatable. And it strikes mostly at men my age, and I had no idea. I was just completely blindsided by the diagnosis. And it, it's a cancer that invades the bone marrow, and so you have a lot of bone destruction. And I was quite honestly not prepared for a lot of that. I had four compression fractures in my spine, I had my hole in my pelvis. It was a very, very painful ordeal. But I tried to keep up a front about it. I, first of all, we kept it very secret. I didn't want to be on the internet, Tom Brokaw, a cancer victim. And I had a lot of big projects that I had to finish for NBC, so I, would, I was at homebound most of the time and working from there, but then I would kind of pull myself together to go on Letterman to promote a 50th anniversary of the JFK assassination on Jon Stewart to do the same thing without letting them know what I was going through. But the, the big lessons are that a cancer strikes one member of your family, but the whole family is in, in effect infected because they all get involved in your care. Very helpful to have another physician who's not a cancer specialist, who is your ombudsman, who's off to the side, interpreting, asking the right questions of the primary care doctors, you know, doing research for you. I have a brilliant doctor daughter in San Francisco who filled that role for me as caregiver and interpreter and other and other things, and uh, it was it was harder than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but I've been through a lot of tough times in my life, and then I would think when I'd get start to feel sorry for myself. I think about the kids that I saw in Afghanistan and Iraq and medevac flights who were coming home without legs or in body bags and what their families were going through. Or I'd see somebody in the street, you know, who was being pushed in a wheelchair and I thought, look, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna beat this at some point so I wanna get out of it. There were some amusing moments as well. I went on uh, John Stewart without telling him and we were keeping it secret at that point and then six months later it does come out. John immediately writes me an email saying, you were one tough SOB, I had no idea you had cancer. And I wrote back to him and I said, John, there was no reason for me to trouble you with my difficulties. And he wrote back to me immediately saying, you cannot be Jewish. If I had gas, I would trouble you with my difficulties. <laughs> so there, there were those times as well. And what I, what I, why I wrote the book and why we did the program last night was to help families who are going through this. I'm a high profile person with a lot of resources, but everything gets leveled when you've got cancer. And, uh, and there are some small things that you need to do. You need to manage your own case. You had ask the tough questions. Get friends uh, who, uh, who can be helpful to you. Let the rest of your friends know that you'll be back to them when you have news. You can't answer the phone 20 times a day saying, how are you doing? You've just got to concentrate on, on getting well. Um, and then finally, uh, what you have to do as an outsider without cancer is that you, we often have sympathy for our friends who have cancer. You can't be empathetic until you have cancer or it enters your family. And it bring, we were a very close family before. We really became even closer during all of this. And it has, I don't think it's changed us profoundly. It just made us more grateful for the great life that we already have. So I end the book by saying, 
is toch een woord, Joef. Out of adversity can emerge abundance in strange kinds of ways. Yeah, thank you. Uh, imagine you're speaking to um, the students at High Point University who are enrolled in the second largest school. We have seven schools and colleges on this campus. One of them is led by a man uh, named uh, Wilfred Tremblay. He's the dean of the school. It's the second largest. They're all communication majors. And you're speaking to them, and you want to give them three pieces of advice. What are they? Uh, the best... Uh rule on journalism came from the same man who helped me arrange the interview with Gorbachev. He said, journalism, the business of now, next. And young communication majors have to think in the same way, now, next. Now is a combination of traditional media and digital. Uh, they were still kind of going into the future side by side. Digital has become, will become ever more important. So you have to be very familiar with the digital world and have real dexterity and understand what's there. Uh, as well as the traditional world. And then, this will never go away. You have to write with clarity and with understanding, and it's based on facts. It can't be based on your own instincts or speculation or what you, how you would like the world to be. Clarity is extraordinarily important in journalism in whatever form you use. And so there are some wonderful books that are still, uh, I think, very useful, the Strunk book on, on writing. The best written publication in America today is The New Yorker. Uh, the best editor is David Remnick, who runs it. And uh, they have the best writers, and I read it faithfully every week, even though I'm at an advanced stage in my life, because I'm always picking up techniques or hearing phrases or thinking of new ways to do things. In our business, it's a kind of a wicked combination of writing traditionally and also writing for the ear. You're not writing just for the eye and for the, for the brain. And the master at it, and was my mentor in many ways, was David Brinkley in the early days of Huntley and Brinkley, because he got that. He saw television as a medium in which people are reacting emotionally to what they're seeing, so how do you penetrate them with the facts that are required? And he developed what I called a narrative style, which he, he was a storyteller, and the stories always had facts attached to them. A perfect example, and I had many of them because I listened to everything that he had to say. When Bobby Kennedy was killed in Los Angeles, uh, it was a terribly traumatic year, as you may remember. 15,000 died in Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson was driven out of the race by Gene McCarthy first, and then Bobby gets in. And uh, before Bobby was killed, Dr. King was killed in Memphis. It was a very emotional time. And Bobby lived for almost 24 hours, and then he died. And there was this cortege, in effect. And we were covering it by helicopter. Uh, and it left uh, the hospital in central Los Angeles, and it got on the Harbor Freeway, and it was starting down the Santa Monica Freeway to the airport. And David just let that play out. No words were required at that point. And then he said this, for the second time in three years, a Kennedy widow is in a black limousine behind another black limousine carrying the casket that contains the body of her husband to an airport in Western America where it will be loaded onto an airplane and flown back to the East Coast, the nation's capital, so the morning can begin stopped. It's all you needed to know. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that is the kind of thing that I try to do when I'm writing for television. Then I have to switch gears when I'm writing my books. Mm -hmm. But my friends all say to me, we hear you in your books, you know, because I, I don't make the shift entirely. Uh, I write not like um, Philip Roth, nobody writes as well as he does, or other Flannery O'Connor wrote beautifully. And uh, I just wrote a, a, a uh, something for Bill Styron, who was a Southerner. Uh, he left behind a collection of nonfiction, and I wrote the forward to it, and I read his stuff. And nobody writes like Southerners. I, I, it's honest to God, they, they are the best, because I think in the South, people live uh, so close to each other and care about their culture so much. And the South was a storytelling place. You know, it's when they, when they first started it. When the South first started, the people 
came from the English tradition of story telling stories and sharing ideas with each other. So it's a really rich literary environment, and I, I'm always tuned to the Southern writers. Anyhow, uh, that's important for people, uh, even those racing into the new future of journalism. You've got to write. So digital, get conversed with it, but don't give up the fundamentals. Tom, let me read something for you. Paul Harvey, the syndicated uh, radio personality, who was really heard from border to border and coast to coast by millions every day, wrote these words. Take a moment and remember Anthony Red Brockall being buried today in South Dakota, a longtime construction worker, a master of heavy machinery, and his son Tom will begin nightly news next week but how proud his dad must have been that his working class life would produce someone like Tom Brokaw. The irony is you did not know Paul Harvey, but you called him and you asked him this question. What motivated you to say that about my dad? Hmm. And here's what Paul Harvey said. I saw it on the broadcast wire and I just thought about his life growing up in the depression. During the war, a construction worker. And then you have the success that you had. You, Tom. You had. And you know that is the American dream. And your daddy deserved a lot of credit. And now, as Paul Harvey would say, we all know the rest of the story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tom Brokaw. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.